<laughs> oh, okay. So that worked great. Uh, that, that was perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Miss Berlin, if you need to, <laughs> if you need to see what that candy gram. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> made, made it a whole minute. Whole minute into the show. Candy gram. <laughs> oh. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Brian. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. It's 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 Miss Berlin's clone right there. Right? Hey, what's up? Doesn't he look I cute know. in glasses? I, I look cute in glasses too, I think. Um maybe no, not so much. I've been compared to a young um Tony Stark, but uh, you know, it is what it is. So I, I'm the only one who compares James, myself everyone. to Tony Stark. Hey Hello. James. Hey James. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> yeah. he's in the still like somewhat squeaky somewhat deep I, voice stage yeah, i had I, I had squeaks for about uh, 20 years and then i finally got this voice so it is what it is so <laughs> voice for radio yeah I have, I have a face for radio too so um are you gonna like help us with any cybersecurity things um i don't know what's what is like your favorite cybersecurity tip work just say use two-factor authentication no <laughs> hey, get out of here then okay analyze <laughs> all your logs a analyze mm -hmm. logs stuff Make it. he'll get there one day he'll get there one day so um hello everybody uh i'm brian uh miss berlin of course is with us uh j uh j wolf gorlick is with us uh, as well uh today uh this week uh for uh breaking down broadcast breaking down security I'd like to thank all of our followers and listeners for coming on with us tonight. Uh, also, before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pokaloo, Nick Adam, Zero, Jinzo20, Mix Panic, and of course, beforehand, Digital Warhead, of course, for his cheers and bits and Clam Security for their bits before. But I uh, just want to thank everybody for following and, and supporting the, the, the broadcast here with uh, uh, your, your support, your word of mouth advertising and everything. So. Um, been a, been a fun couple weeks. Uh, you know, Miss Berlin hasn't been here for, for, for a little while because of RSA and travel and what have you. And I don't think we've ever had Jay on the show. Uh, Jay, uh, you've never been on our show. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe. Okay. But, okay. uh, not that I can recall, at least not since the Twitch, uh, switch. So. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not since Twitch. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the, the time and effort. Uh, you're muted, Ms. Berlin. That was probably okay. really funny, too. It was hilarious. Now, I said, <laughs> I've, I've barely been on it since the Twitch switch. No, that's okay. Um, you know, you, you're, you're busy. You're doing a lot of stuff with like Red Siege and you're doing some, you know, tabletop exercises with folks. So, uh, you know, we, pre we appreciate when you can take the time to, to join us here. Um, I, I do a lot more Twitch streaming than other folks, obviously, but, um, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing hack box and things like that. So it's, it's, it's some fun times, but, um, so, um, <clears throat> some announcements, uh, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about with, uh, Jay and, and Amanda about the RSA conference that just happened uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, it became, I, I don't know, a super spreader event, uh, in some cases, unfortunately, uh, you know, but it was well received. I, I think there was a lot of good talks that happened over there. Uh, I of, mean, if of, we go by of, the numbers, uh, fifty percent of the people on this call. Jesus, <laughs> wait, fifty percent of three is like two point. Fifty percent of the people that went to RSA. Oh, okay. Got it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Although I have a true. cough, I, I have a cough, but I definitely don't have COVID. Okay. So far. Okay. How, how do you know? I did the I did a regular at home test and a PCR test, and it's my only symptom. So I feel like it's either one psychosomatic or two, maybe allergies. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, digital so warheads. I, I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I was I I was just saying. Uh, digital warhead said uh, for his Father's Day, his wife uh, bought him um, uh, the defensive security handbook. So. You, you've got you've got some more royalty checks coming through in the mail there for like you know Another 20 30 cents three whole dollars oh my god oh my god 
Um, <laughs> so, so Jay, um, you you said uh, what was what was the atmosphere like? At, you know, what was this was like the third, the first RSA after the pandemic in person? Yeah. So <laughs> feel first, feel free to call me Wolfgang or Wolf, whichever Wolf? is, is okay. easier for you. Okay. We don't need to go by the first letter, although we can. It's like J and Q. I mean, it sounds very, uh, you know, mystery you man. Or, uh, That's right. Yeah. Yes. Like, I could be a, a and J and B and J. <laughs> yeah. A and B and J. Nice. I'm I'm Berber. I'm actually alliterative Berber. twice, so it is what it is. Love it. Love it. No, it, it was nice to be back in person. Um, you know, the the last time I was at RSA. I went to the scotch and a cigar party. So we're, you know, having some scotch, having a cigar, great night. And uh, I was talking to uh, to one of all of our friends, uh, Aaron Lintow, and he's like, "I'm this is going to end. This is, you know, this is." Uh, blah, 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 blah. He was in one of his rants. I'm like, you know, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. And he said, "Listen, this is a rare, rare magical moment in time." got a good scotch you got a good cigar we're with friends we're in san francisco it's february it's like you know one day this is all going to end and he turned to me and said wolf i'll tell you right now it already has and that was the last conference that was like the last conversation at the last conference i had and every time i see him I'm like this is your fault you called yep. this and it's your fault it's a conspiracy yep. yes yeah yes. i blame aaron, aaron. Yep. Aaron, uh, yeah. RSA, what, uh, February was t- February, 2020. Uh, and then that was, that was pretty much it. There was lockdown right after. And as a matter of fact, there was a lot of folks who were like, maybe we shouldn't have RSA 2020 because of what was going on there. But, uh, yeah. Um, cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> Jay, did you speak at RSA as well? I did be, <laughs> Jay, I spoke. I spoke, uh, I, I did, uh, I did two talks. I talked on uh, security design and the importance of, you know, really human centric design principles and thinking about how people interact with the system, not only the adversaries, but also the people we want to protect. Talked about that. And coincidentally enough, and ironically enough, considering I came down with COVID, talked about um, all the things we could learn about risk management from what happened in 2020 in a talk called Hindsight is 2020. So pulled out like all the different ways that people were responding to the pandemic, applied them to the NIST RMF, um, and then put on my mask and flew home and promptly tested positive. So yeah, great, <laughs> great examples of, uh, of flawed uh, risk management, I suppose. I was going to say, so should they just not follow anything you talked about? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's worked for you not to so far. So just keep going, keep going. Well, so yeah. one of one of the things I I told I told my wife about the RSA being kind of a somewhat of a spreader event was, and, and she raised the questions like, did you get it at RSA or did you get it on the plane rides go, to or from? Um, right. Because you know RSA or may have been a fairly safe in, event, but yeah, yeah, like randomly in San Francisco. Right. Well, so here's the thing, I. RSA was wrapped up seven weeks of straight travel for me. Oh. The last three weeks were out of a suitcase and I never went back. And I was in uh, San Francisco for several days before RSA. <laughs> so I would say that of all the times on an airplane, um, if that was the one to get me, that would be a little bit odd. I mean, the numbers don't seem yeah. to work out. Nope, that makes sense. That's that makes sense. Um, hey, Super Lolly, um, welcome. Uh, so Super Lolly lives on the other side of the world, so it's like Monday morning for for him. So, um, yeah. So uh, you were talking about risk management. Um, maybe give people a synopsis. Were these talks recorded? Can they see these talks uh, online, or is is you know are they available? So they were recorded. Um, if you have a RSA. Uh, Padge or you know ticket you can log in and see them um i don't know if they've been generally released yet and i'm not sure rsa's approach to that um but so that's the answer to one what was your answer to two i'm sorry it's late at night for me no it's okay uh (laughs) what was your other question yeah i was just asking if they were available so um yeah if you're if it may take a couple weeks is is what what it sounds like uh 
I don't have an RSA badge, so I'm not cool like that. I'll have to I'll have to wait and, and check those out. But uh, yeah, are um, you going to give the talk that you gave at RSA anywhere else? Uh, I am going to probably give different versions of those. Yes, because I, I so in both of the topics, the design one I've I've given various versions of for you know a year or two now. I've been on this mission to explore security design since keynoting Circle City Con in, in 2019. So, I mean, I've covered different aspects of it. This one was new aspects with affordances and, and metrics, but so yes. And on the, the risk management side, um, absolutely people have not you know, what's just risk management in general is so frustrating to me because we started off talking tech, right? I think we all remember we got in this field right. and we we're like, ah, just sit down with the executives. They should care about security. Let me tell you about my domain controllers and my patch levels, and uh, and everyone just like, I, I remember the CFO going, "What's a, what's a domain controller?" And so, so being the savvy social engineer hackers we are, we listened, and they're like, "Oh, they keep talking about business risk. We should do risk." And we got into risk management and promptly made it just as technical and as opaque as uh, Tyek and say, "Oh, by the way, here's my Monte Carlo simulation, and I have determined data," and people just. So I do think there, there is an awful lot to the psychology of people, how they make decisions, um, how they accept risk or negotiate risk, right? How they view things. There's an awful lot to that that just is overlooked when someone's like, oh, yeah, follow the NISC RMF or, you know, ISO has this ISMS process that you can follow for risk management. Like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. But people don't ever work that way, ever in just about any domain, but maybe they will for cyber, we keep thinking, but no. So yes, I would certainly be covering these areas uh, in future events. Okay. And, and Miss Berlin, you started off uh, Monday morning, like most everybody, uh, you know, in the world, they started on a panel of Kubernetes. Um, no, I'm sorry. Zero trust is the other, the other thing that everybody doesn't really understand that, the other uh, thing that I idea. also yeah. don't know about. Yeah, well, that's okay. I don't either. Um, that's why we had Jay Beal on on Monday because I was like, I I have had several people on talking about Kubernetes, and I still don't understand why I would want to use it in not at my own office. So, um, how did the zero trust panel go? It was packed. Really, nice. so eight thirty on a Monday morning. It hmm. was packed. Interesting. I was, I was floored at the amount of people that were in there to listen to a panel about zero trust at 8.30 in the morning on a Monday. Okay. And, and, and because it's a panel, 8.30 on a Monday morning, I'm sure all of the problems of zero trust were solved. We fixed everything. Everything is fixed. Okay, yep. good. Oh, good. Yep. Um, all of us are out of jobs. Oh, uh, damn it. I apologize. I was, and it's, it's okay. Fine. I'm almost retired anyway, so it's all right. It's fine. <laughs> Another 25 years and I'll be well, good. It, so. it, it honestly went really, really well. It was a panel of uh, five of us. Mm -hmm. uh, me being the only person that's not written a zero trust book. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's um, still time. No. No, but funny thing, after you get put on a panel about zero trust at RSA, Imagine the book offers that come in. They're like, please write a book about zero trust. I'm like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Like I, they barely got me on my panel. Um, I, I was proud to represent the skeptical portion of people that talk about zero trust sometimes. <laughs> so, my, so favorite, we... my favorite question from the moderator so Jason Garbus, he he actually wrote one of the books on, on Zero Trust, and I think we've had him on the podcast, um, was, are we asking too much of people when we say you should implement Zero Trust? And my answer was yes, <laughs> because I think that if you look like, if you look at the world in, in, in total, right? Like all of the people that have a network to be designed or a network to be secured. Um, what percentage of those people do you think can even come close to starting down a zero trust path? And it's a very small percentage. Like 
there are a huge amount of like SMBs that have one person that don't even know what their assets are. They don't know what applications are on their network. They don't know, like they are just like putting out fires left and right, trying to do like whatever's right and make sure that they're not the next person, next like organization on the news. You can't right. go to that person and be like, it, it's like, it's like, a you know, somebody in the 1% being like, why can't everybody bring themselves out of poverty? This is crap. Like it's the same viewpoint. Like you right. cannot expect people with that much tech debt and no resources to just be like, oh, I'm going to go down the zero trust path. So that was my. It, it's, it's funny you say that, Amanda. I'm working on a zero trust field guide right now. And so we did this meta analysis and there's like 5,000 people who are like, oh yeah, here's where we're at with zero trust, all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do data scientists. I just look at the facts, but it's like, what do people who are, have mature uh, zero trust programs look like? They've got buy-in from their executive team. They've got support from their peers. They've got plenty of staff. They've got plenty of budget. I'm like, that's a cheat code. Like, if you have all that. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. There's nothing that the security program probably isn't doing at that point, right? I right. mean, right. Well, I've got plenty of staff. Well, yeah. That's okay, a mature no. security <laughs> program. Yeah. And there's yeah, it's, there's a reason Google can make that work, and they were the the, the lead people on that, yeah, and and mm -hmm. Microsoft and all these other folks. Um, the it it just seems like it's so nebulous as to what people really want from Zero Trust. Is it the authentication portion? Is it you know uh, a defense or you know offensive uh, you know defensive capabilities? You know what what is it that they are expecting to get out of Zero Trust when they decide they want to implement it? Other than the fact that they can say. Well, we have zero trust, uh, zero trust in what is, you know, and, and that's that's one thing that I've always kind of really wondered about in, in terms of what's the ultimate goal for zero trust. Is it just to get rid of, you know, infrastructure like firewalls and, and, and VPNs? Uh, you know, is it to rely less on, uh, you know, uh, you know, having having IT, you know, doing things and everything's going to be, you know, based in the cloud and you're just going to have to just drop out a bunch of YubiKey tokens. And, you know, I, I just. I don't, I don't. And like you said, there's tech debt. So it's hard to overcome that tech debt to be able to put in new stuff that's going to in introduce additional tech debt. Um, and, and, and where does that fit in budget? And, you know, that's, I guess that's why they have consultancies that, you know, like for zero trust implementations. And they just, you know, I would imagine the best thing to do would be to start from scratch, build the zero trust infrastructure, and then put all your old shit into it and then figure out what you can consolidate and get rid of. But I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a, a zero trust consultant, so I wouldn't know what the best way is to implement that shit in the first place. Me neither. <laughs> not a zero trust <laughs> consultant, but based off, uh, so like uh, we had Chase Cunningham on there and he does it all the time, right? We <laughs> no, had, um, yeah, we had, um, gosh, uh, Jerry, oh, what's Jerry's last name? It's been a long couple of weeks. Um, but we had a, a couple of really good people that do that all the time, either from a risk-based perspective or just like pure zero trust. And they actually recommended doing a portion. So like make, make these business critical servers or these functions zero trust first. <laughs> and like, it's kind of like a walk before you crawl thing. It's kind of like, right how do you implement two vector auth or whatever, right? Like you just don't do like turn it on everywhere. You have to MFA to everything you ever auth to like, that's crazy. Uh, but doing it like at a kind of strategic piece by piece thing, as opposed to we need to be zero trust by the end of the year, 100%. Like it, most people I don't think will ever get to hundred percent unless you're starting a company from scratch maybe. Um, but taking like old antiquated stuff that, that you may not even necessarily need zero trust, depending on who you're talking to from a risk perspective, like do the important stuff first and then like right. kind of go down that journey of trying to get there. But you have to really plan that stuff out and right. not just be like, we're going to be zero trust and you know, that's, that's our, it's uh that's a very black and white view of, of how to do it. I think. Yeah. It, 
it, yeah, it's a I, weird go ahead go ahead wolf i was gonna say i've been doing zero trust strategy and planning workshops for probably three years now two three years now okay. monthly and yeah everything you're saying amanda is, is spot on right take an incremental approach fight your battles know where it makes sense um, a lot of these uh, vendors and a lot of the white papers are like, oh, you will never succeed until you have 100%. Well, no security works that way. No, 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 exactly. no, 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 no control exactly. ever put in place has been 100%. Right, right. Um, so, so Digital War had asked the question. I recently read an article on SecJuice. It said the Fed government switching to a zero trust model, and it's only a matter of time before businesses and corps follow suit. Uh, thoughts? Yeah. And if so, what would a business with zero trust look like? So, um, yes, that's true. The executive order came out um, and then said everyone needs a plan. CISA has replied and CISA has a maturity model. So actually, if you if you download uh, from their website, you can get the CISA maturity model. I think it's in draft one right now. And it builds on NIST 800-207, which was finalized in, in 2020. So we have a, a common architecture. We have a maturity model people can follow. But for most businesses, frankly, it's going to be risk-based authentication with multi-factor. It's going to be network access control. I mean, it's going to be some of these fundamental controls we've talked about for a long time, just implemented in a way that's doing policy enforcement and an identity. Right. It's like an. It's like. It, it was. It was really interesting. So when I got asked to be on the panel, I'm like, all right, like. I've heard all of like the snake oil stuff around zero trust. Like I really want to know like currently what do people think? And so I tweeted out like, what's the first thing that you think about when someone says zero trust? And almost everybody other than like some really, really funny responses were um, it is least privilege access with a marketing budget. Mm. <laughs> right. And it's, which is sad because it's more than that. Like if you, if you look right. into it, it's more than just least privilege, least privilege as we know it from like a, like a, a normal, like networking and access perspective. It's if you take least privilege access with multi-factor and give it context, right? Right. Like you're, you're, you are doing some kind of context and automation around that authentication and access like that's supposed to be what zero trust is it's not somebody getting a piece of like getting an email or getting a piece of paper on their desk being like oh now i have to create this user and add them to these groups and this person says that they have that access and they're done for forever yep right that's like the normal model that a lot of people have and yeah. That's not zero trust. That's least privilege access, depending on how you have set it up technically. But like zero trust is more than that. And sure, it has a marketing budget because there were there were like 30 to 40 talks that had the word zero trust in it, <laughs> say, which I was I was just like amazed at. Um, and at, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like people don't take it seriously because of all of the fluff around it. Right. It, it's so it's nebulous, right? I mean, there's so many different ways that people have suggested what zero trust is. I mean, if your management was to come in and go, Hey, let's implement zero trust. You could give them something and they're like, no, 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 I don't want that. I want this. Well, you didn't say you wanted this type of zero trust. It's almost like there's different flavors depending on what they want of it. Um, so uh, FS Montenegro, thank you. Uh, long time friend of the show, as a matter of fact, uh, he said context, but also continuous verification in my honest opinion. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and digital war had said, while zero trust will increase security, could it potentially decrease productivity and cost and time of doing business? I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, thoughts from Wolf, Amanda. Not if you do it right. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is, to, to Amanda's point, we've been talking about trust boundaries for a long time. And oftentimes, for the sake of productivity, we've created very large trust boundaries, right? One, one network segment. I've segmented my network, says every company ever until they send in the patent test and really segment means 
I've got different VLANs and I'm routing any, any anyways. Right. So effectively, what we're talking about with zero trust is a very tight scoped trust boundary. Exactly what Fernando was saying, something continuous, something well defined. Now, this gets back to what I was talking about in my, my RSA talk, which is security design. If you first spend time with your um, business folks, whoever you're doing with this, your privileged admins, your DevOps team, your people in finance, whoever you're doing this with, your remote users. If you first spend time with them and you plot out what their workflow looks like and you make sure that 99% of the time that they're found that workflow, we're getting out of the way because they're on a machine that we recognize, authenticating in a way we recognize. Why even ask again? You've already authenticated, save a token. I mean, from a location, accessing apps, behaving in a, a behavior that indicates that I can trust you. Let's get right. the hell out of the way. Let's get the hell out of the way. Now, I say that, and anyone who was paying attention to what Amanda said in the beginning will automatically say, well, if that sounds great, when am I going to have time to sit down with my user population and do good security design when I'm trying to patch log4j and someone just told me that they provisioned a whole bunch of AWS servers and oh my God, no one told me about that. I thought we were in Azure. Right. Or, you know, oh, we're both in AWS and Azure and we're only, you know, half-assing it in either one of those and, and we're not... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I've heard there's a Ron Swanson security quote there. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. I, I mean, multi-cloud things are now a, a big deal. We, we've had several discussions on our, in our Slack and on discord about, yeah, we're in AWS, we're in Azure and we're in GCP because we want failover or, or whatever. And I'm like, why there's, you know, they're all global networks. Just pick a different availability zone or whatever the hell it, Azure calls them or whatever GCP calls them and go that way. You're, you're, you're adding needless complexity to these things and you're not going to be able to, you know, be, you know, as agile as you want to be thinking, you know, that you can just drop over to different clouds, but I don't know. That's, that's what their management thinks. So, uh, yeah, it, it's up to them. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, thank, thank y'all for the questions there. Uh, so what's the difference? Between, okay. So we've talked a little bit about authentication and authorization kind of things. How is that different from using like a, a federated login? Because I use right now my job, which is right over here, my work, my workspace. It's right over here. So I'm, I'm at work. I'm not at work. I'm at work. I'm not. I can log in. I can gain access to everything I need through a federated login. So technically, you know, if I don't have, you know, if I don't have my YubiKey token here, you know, if I don't have my other little hard token thing, I don't get to work. That's that's how I get to work now. I don't even use VPN. So how is a, a federated login or zero trust? How are they different, or are they the same, or are they just you know different sides of the same coin? Do you want me to take that, or you want to take that? All right. So here's the thing: when you're logging in, are you going through a policy engine that's determining the context and conditions of the request? and requiring strong off when it makes sense. If you are, really, that's the that's the only question. Right. And at that point in time, the perimeter, now think about how we used to define perimeters, right? We used to define perimeters as uh, a network firewall and we're you know, IP level, TCP, UDP level, maybe application level, uh, making a decision. Well, we can't wrap a firewall around every application. We can't wrap a firewall around every request when so much of it is using a federated ID to a SaaS application, probably from someone, uh, you know, just like you, Brian, who's working from home and at a location that we don't necessarily have control over. What we can do is move that access uh, decision up to wherever we're authenticating. So now whenever I'm logging into these SaaS apps, I'm making sure to the best of my ability to check to make sure your device meets policy, you meet policy, all those sort of things. Now, one additional thing of that is, all right, in the old days, firewalls, crunchy and, and chewy, right? Crunchy exterior, chewy interior. We've effectively replaced that exact thing. If I'm only checking on a login that you are you and probably only checking once as you SSO into a thousand different applications, uh, 1200 is I think the current enterprise average. Jesus. Um, if I'm only checking on a login, I've effectively recreated that crunchy exterior because I'm not paying attention to anything you do within the app itself. So what happens if it really is you, but you have malicious intent and you log into one of your apps and start downloading a whole bunch of data 
or making a whole bunch of configuration changes you can't. Today, most solutions can't revoke trust during that point. So one of the things I'm really intrigued about is like the work by the Open uh, ID Connect uh, Foundation that's looking at shared signals. So one of my favorite examples of this is I log in with my federal identity. I log into my HR portal. I download a whole bunch of documents I shouldn't, probably for tax fraud. That trips the HR portal to say, this is malicious behavior. That shared signal is made available to everything that I touch. And suddenly I can't get into Dropbox or Box or SharePoint or anywhere where I would go to upload files. That type of uh, connection, which is really where I think Zero Trust is going, is fascinating to me. If we can get the apps not only to be the, the Chewy uh, component that we're logging into, but also to be uh, effectively network security monitors, right, of behavior analytics that feeds back to that policy engine, ooh, some cool stuff uh, becomes possible. Now, again, thinking about the security poverty line, thinking about reality, there's a lot of things that have to be in place for that. But it's really fascinating to me the direction in which this could head. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. <clears throat> it, it's it's complicated. I mean, and there's like like we have talked about before. There's a lot of organizations that ha don't have the assets to do this. Um, and uh, bringing in a consultancy to do that does not help that budget line any anymore. And how okay so I, I i think i think it's it's hard enough just to set it up what's care and feeding look like for this i think uh fernando, uh fernando mentioned it you know continuous verification of these things um is it any easier to maintain this uh over you know traditional ad type services what's care and feeding and maintenance look like on something like this So one of the main use cases still has to be to dump into your SIM. So your SOC is still going to be involved. Mm. Um, mm. Your, your help desk needs to be notified. I was having this conversation with an organization that had rolled it out. And it was pretty interesting. They basically logged into their firewalls with, uh, with their MFA when they're in uh, the office. And then that gave them a token that would determine what uh, land they were in and what their trust boundary looked like. Pretty interesting. But when it went off the rails, the help desk was like, well, do you have Wi-Fi access? And, you know, they start way up here and it's like, yeah, but it wasn't Wi-Fi access. It was the fact that his AV was out of date and therefore was he was sitting in another VLAN and therefore and therefore. There is a lot of the troubleshooting components. I don't think we've really thought through. Hmm. So there, there is certainly going to be more work on the help desk to support these use cases if the tool, um, if the policy engine isn't providing any feedback to the users. Because why was I denied access? Who knows, right? If I'm checking a hundred different policy things. And and think about this for a minute. All right, you're sitting there and you're like, all right, I need to deploy a hundred policy things. What's gonna break? And who's gonna yell at me? How do I know, how do I de-risk that policy decision? That's another area that can be very, very difficult around because there's not necessarily good policy mod modeling. Um, a lot of these tools don't necessarily do monitoring, so I can't throw it in monitor mode and run monitored mode for six weeks like we used to always do with right. DLP policy and VPN policy. So they're, they're, the, the, the early days of Zero Trust is where we're at, and there's a lot of these more uh, interesting features that we're going to need to build out uh, to really start making it supportable early early days uh i feel so okay uh I, I i believe we had our first discussion with zero trust folks almost five six years ago so i'm yeah i mean may i i i want to say the the dudes who wrote the o'reilly books were, we were on about five years ago so um that's i hope this doesn't years. i mean yeah, as, I, as far as tech goes that's still right that's still pretty early i mean because I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of people didn't even start looking at zero trust legitimately until, I mean, still four or five years ago is not that long. Yeah, that's true. As long yeah, as it's I mean, not the IPv6 of technology where we're, you know, 30 years from now and we're like, oh, we're be. still trying to get, you know, half-assed. We're still know. trying to get people to patch. So. Right, right. <laughs> well, we're, we're talking about authorization earlier, right? Our back, we've been struggling with since 2004 was the last... What was the ANSI standard? 
Right. So in my mind, we're still in early days in terms of products being rolled out that and adoption. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. When we can get a box that we'll just plug in and it, you know, does all of it for us, then we'll know we've hit, you know, peak, peak uh, zero trust, I think. But, you know, then, right. then we'll just call it a domain controller and just call it good. So, you know, we'll be back to the domain controller. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. So, uh, let me see, uh, any other questions from, uh, from our friends? Thank you. Blood Knight one for coming on and joining us. Thank you to all the excellent comments. Um, we, we were actually talking about RSA and then we got on to zero trust. Was there anything else, any other events? Cause you know, RSA is one of those ones where it's like, it's almost like Vegas for me. It's like, is it too corporate to go to RSA? Can you still be a legitimate security person and, you know, still go to RSA? Uh, uh, you know, it must so have I, a I, huge ass vendor pit. Yeah. I had it on my list of the conference that I never, ever wanted to go to. Uh, until you got invited and then you're all like, yeah. No, I didn't even put in the CFP. Uh Oh, um, I was asked to be on a panel. It's several years in a row, like I was oh. asked to put, be put on a panel. Okay. And another year, sure, whatever. Like, go ahead and put me on. And then our um, uh, our marketing team wanted to put me in on a talk. I'm like, sure, if you want to write the CFP, go for it. Right. Like, I don't care. It won't get accepted. Okay. okay. Um, and then both of them did. I'm like, oh. shit. <laughs> now, All right. Now All I right. have to go there and say, um, it was surprisingly better than I thought it was going to be. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, it wasn't all, it wasn't all fluff. Okay. That's cool. That's good to so, know. So, uh, definitely a lot of it, but it, de- it wasn't all, uh, I, I, I it, it was, it was really interesting. So like I did my, I was really nervous. So this was my first time, like I've, I've given talks at, dozens of other conferences that are like hacker infosec cons this was the first one i gave a talk at that was corporate Mm. and i was kind of nervous and i did my best to make it so it was a a very equal balance of something that a c-level would find interesting and something that like somebody that was fully hands-on technical would find interesting Mm. And I think I did an okay job. I mean, it was a decent turnout. Um, the coolest thing that I I, I ran into was um, during the talk I gave, like one of the questions I asked the audience is, because um, this was like about, an, a, 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 like about finishing moves. So like an attack that uh, captures your entire uh, ESC database for Active Directory, and now somebody's taking all of your creds and they're going to go crack them, right? So right. when that happens, you're screwed, and you need to either create a new forest or there's like this Microsoft um, network eviction process that you can go through. So I'm like, who here in the audience has gone through this Microsoft network eviction process or created a new forest in Active Directory? I'd love to hear about your stories. And two people actually raised their hands. I'm like, holy crap. Like, I'd love, like, as a, as a sysadmin previously, that seems super painful. And I would never want to do that. <laughs> um, interesting, but still super painful. And I went up and talked to this guy afterwards, or he came up to me and talked afterwards in the hallway. He was like, yeah, like, um, I was actually one of the 10 people that wrote the Microsoft network <laughs> process. I'm like, wow. holy crap. <laughs> nice. That's great. Uh, thanks for coming to my sis month talk. I hope you got something out of it. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. There was more nice. people there than I thought there was going to be as far as like technical perf- perspective stuff. Okay. Wolf, how about you? Uh, you know, what did, did, uh, did, what, what did you get out of uh, RSA that uh, you were, you were hoping to get or not get? Yeah. So um, we already talked about what I was hoping not to get. Right. Um, from <laughs> failed. No, you got COVID. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. From from uh, you know, are are some conferences more corporate than others? Sure. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of good people are there. A lot of my friends are there. So I love the networking. Okay. I love catching up with folks that I don't oftentimes see. Um, I spent a lot of time with startups. So uh, on Monday, when this panel that Amanda was talking about was going on, I had uh, twenty meetings back to back, which was terribly planning on my part. I should have said no 
or realized what I was getting myself into. Uh, the organizer was like, do you, do you realize what you signed up for? Are you sure? And to this day, I always hear that is, of course, I know what I'm doing. One of these days, I'm going to recognize when the experts say, um, Wolf, did you really, do you really want to do that? That I will say no, and I'll come to my senses. But that day was not the day. So I spent a lot of time with startups, spent a lot of time hearing about some of the new tech that's being built. Um, it, was, it was a good time. Okay. Got to catch up with my full team in person, which never happens. I've been seeing everyone over Zoom in this window that we're on right now. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we uh, uh I I was I was a little resistant to go to an on-site with my own company back in May, but uh, like you you said you uh or you know probably ended up finding out that yeah, there's still actually a need to have, you know, in in person physical discussions with people it's it just helps facilitate communication better so um i uh i i i would hesitate going maybe now immediately right after everything's going on but uh yeah i i i definitely uh i definitely found value in what i was doing there um so for both of you since both of you spoke do you f- do you find that you make that you 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 how am I, how, how do I say this? So when we go to conferences like, um, circle city con and, you know, those, those kinds of conferences that are more, you know, what I would not call overly professional, they're, they're, they're infosec cons, but they're not RSA. They're not <laughs> ISC squared. They're not OWASP kind of things with a larger governing mm-hmm. body. Do you find that your talks get more traction? or you, you feel like you're doing more good by speaking at these conferences versus a, a circle city con or a blue team. And I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to disparage circle city con and, and you know, those they're, they're great conferences. I would go to circle city con if I could, um, I'll be in Europe at the time, but, um, you know, there, there's a different audience, right? So, you know, what do you, do you feel like you, you get more, more out of, of giving the talks for folks that, you know, are going to be C level leader types, uh, versus, uh, a normal, uh, you know, a normal infosec conference. Being it was my first one. I have to say I've had, I've never had so many people take notes at a talk. Notes. Okay. Um, yeah. I... Like half of the audience were, were diligently writing down notes. Okay. Of what I was talking about, which was interesting. I don't know if it's like just this perceived like you paid a shit ton of money to get here. You might want to like get something out of it, um, okay. or or what it was. But yeah, I've never had so many people just like crazy writing great questions at the end. I mean, I I my my talk went for I think it was like thirty eight out of the forty minutes that I had, um, okay. and they give you ten minutes for questions. I used up all of it. And the same thing for the panel, like there were just like a crazy amount of people writing down notes. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it was, it, but, but then again, like at a non corporate ish conference, you get more one-on-one time people in the hallway, right. right? Because it's smaller and you can talk to people about just like, whatever you want whenever it's not just like like you said wolf like you're like meeting 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 like me too like i was just running like all right like i have to go to this thing and i have to i worked our booth like i've never worked a booth before so i worked our booth and like answered a bunch of technical questions all day like for our salespeople, and it was just like i i think at a non corporate thing you get more one-on-one time with people so maybe they just don't they don't feel like they need to take notes hmm. Okay. All right. Did we lose? Oh, there he is. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I find it's very difficult to value one event to the other. Right. Um, so you know the 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 RSA nature is certainly much more buttoned down, much more let's get to work, much more of a professional uh, atmosphere. <clears throat> but I mean. So Circle City kind of can't wait because their theme this uh, year is uh, Saturday uh, morning cartoons. I saw that. Yeah. And that. my whole talk is on security awareness training. I'm going to get the entire audience to sing the after these messages. Right. 
And then every one of my section headings is the opening credits from classic 1990s cartoons. That is going to be one of the most fun decks to create and give. I've already created some of it, but you know how the magic is creating the rest of it the day of. We all know that. Right. So, I mean, there there is a a degree of of magic that happens at community events. I don't think can be replicated. Mm. Uh, but certainly, you know, you you want to have conversations at all levels, so that when things need to get done. Um, everyone in an organization is more or less aligned. And I think people who only speak at like a B-sides versus only speak at the Gartner event um, are, are missing out at really understanding the problem space from multiple perspectives and really getting their message out there. So to, to answer your, your question, Brian, I don't think it's one versus the other. I think the best way is to experience multiple different events. Very cool. Yeah. And people go to, con- obviously they go to conferences for different things. Some people like to go for lobby con and uh, see friends, um, you know, but I was like, you know, let's say, you know, I, obviously it sounded like there was a lot of startup work and, and you were working with some startups and stuff. So there's, there was a different motivation for you to go to this conference versus, you know, another conference because obviously RSA is where people want to get seen. And yeah, you know, I, I was just thinking back to, you know, RSA's had kind of a, you know, where the keynote speaker is somebody who isn't even in security or something like that. And it's like, why are they even here? I I don't, I, I think they had the guy from Mr. Robot one year or something like that, but they had like some Hollywood star or an actor or something. And they they were like, why is this person even here? Um, uh, it sounds like I need to go just to check it out. I shouldn't probably, you know, be throwing, throwing stones on that, that particular, uh, house. Uh, um, I, 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 were y'all able to find a hotel room that didn't cost five hundred dollars a night? Really? Uh. <laughs> somebody, somebody had actually said they were. Uh, I had a friend of mine I used to work with uh, said that he was in a nine hundred dollar a night, and it wasn't even mm-hmm. a good hotel room uh, uh, in his opinion. So I was like, "Well, crap. I guess I could go, you know, get an Airbnb in Sausalito or something like that, and you know, Uber it in at a hundred dollars a time." But um, yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, I guess I'll have to bite the bullet and maybe see if my company will, uh, you know, do that. So, um, cool. Um, well, uh, last thoughts on RSA before we go to the other topic and the other show that I wanted to, to have uh, Wolf on. I think everybody should, I, I, I think everybody should go to RSA at least once. So I'll, I'll say that I, I will say that at least once if they can swing. I'd go or, again. Okay. I wouldn't pay for it myself. Agree. Right. Right. Just right, because right, San Francisco is crazy expensive. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. And I mean, I've I've went off and on for years, so um, yeah, I'm 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 admittedly biased. I like San Francisco. Okay. I don't hate I don't hate San Francisco either. I've been up there a couple times. Uh, yeah, I used to live. I used to be stationed in Monterey, uh, so oh, okay. I got to got to go up uh, Santa Cruz, uh, San Jose. That whole area. I love, I love middle, middle California. I thought, uh, San, uh, Carmel and that whole big Sur, um, that, that whole area in the, in the central coast is just uh, amazing. So besides, I hope besides Monterey is a thing. I would love to drive up from San Diego when I get down there. So, um, cool. All right. So, uh, Wolf, the other reason we had you on, uh, was to, uh, you were talking about risk management, risk frameworks and security awareness training. So, um, Part of security awareness training is doing things like, you know, uh, pulling up your, 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 your LMS system, you know, running flash five, you know, being, you know, pulling up, you know, videos that, you know, are in black and white and, and, you know, talking about how your active directory is awesome. And then, you know, clicking all the way through answering questions that a five-year-old could answer and you get a hundred percent and you're done. Um, uh, other things are like awareness training, like the new hotness is fishing tests and fishing exams. And like, you know, you know, we'll send out a cool email that tricks everybody into clicking on it. And um, so we've had discussions about security awareness training in the past here. We've actually discussed it in news articles and stuff. And they were talking about how, you know, 70 percent of companies are spending their budget on security awareness training. 
And yet we still have fishing. We still have whaling. We still have vishing and smishing and all the ishings uh, and, and breaches uh, caused by that and ransomware. Um, you're this, you, you have discussions about security awareness. What is the, in your opinion, the, the issue that we have with security awareness training? Oh, it's just, we do it all wrong. I mean, we, look, here, here's the thing. Uh, one of my favorite studies about this was in 2020. They looked at the very best, the very best of security awareness training programs. And they found that less than 15% of the people changed their behavior afterwards. Okay. Less than 15% of the best, the best programs. I recently got to hang out with some of the researchers at uh, MSU and I was like, hey, what's going on? Because I hear anecdotally that we do a phishing campaign and then people's performance on recognizing fish actually goes down (laughs) the very next time a fish comes through. What's going on? And they said, well, part of the problem is that so much of the awareness information we try to give people is outdated or wrong. Like, oh, it needs to have typos and needs to call you by the wrong name and, you know, hover over the URL. Um, And you effectively train someone to think if it doesn't show those indicators, it's not a fish. So if you look at some of the like common good fish these days, it doesn't even match our security awareness training. And you, uh, the researchers were doing this really interesting thing where they're like interrupting people. Hey, what, what do you think is going on? What do you think? After they did a fish test. And, uh, and one of the people kept saying, no, I know this isn't a fish because it doesn't, doesn't look like what they trained us. Like there's no typos. And so they just kept going on and on and on to their transferring money, right? I mean, right. it's ridiculous things like that. The, the problem is that we try to make security everyone's business, which I think in theory sounds lovely, right? Safety is job one. Uh, while neglecting the fact that security is, is our job <laughs> and, and you're never going to be able to get people to know it as good as we do. And yet when you don't know it as good as we do, we then mock you uh, and, and make comics about you and, and tell jokes about how terrible everybody is. So, I mean, just in general, I think the entire, the entire way that we approach awareness and education uh, needs to be rethought. And there's certainly some companies and some individuals who are doing that. But it's it's so frustrating to, to me to see it again and again and again be done wrong. Yeah. Okay. My uh, my my wife who is uh, getting her doctorate in adult learning and education, she said a lot of curriculum that is being built is built with the mindset that we're all still in high school and we're all still learning in in specific ways, like we did in high school, where it was like, you know, repetition, repetition, repetition. When in fact, at our advanced youth, uh, we learn differently and, and she is, is, uh, one of her, one of her, uh, you know, discussions on that. And she works in the LMS field, uh, currently where she works is, you know, how they are making training that is useful in, in, in this case. Uh, and, uh, um, I know that I don't learn the same way that I used to learn, uh, because I don't have the time and effort to do that. And, you know, a lot of the training that, I have been given for security training one because I, you know, I can just skip to the end normally and get an 80% on those things. But, um, yeah, I mean, it does, it doesn't matter what kind of training it is. It's like, if you have to sit and watch a video or, you know, something that's more than, you know, 20 minutes, I'm immediately checked out. I don't know if it's my brain or whatever it is, but, um, I, I do not retain hardly anything like you said. Um, uh, so what are, what are our options here if, you know, the, the, the limit of somebody's span of attention is, you know, 25 minutes? I mean, the MTV generation, you know, where we're, our, our attention span is as good as a music video or something like that. So the MTV generation, when was the last time music videos were on MTV? <laughs> I, I watch, I watch I was in high 80s. school. I was in high school, probably. Okay. Middle school. That's true. <laughs> Great school. It's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, I'm old. <laughs> God damn. Well, and and so you know, this is this is another thing, right? Is that um, we're we're still teaching the same things that were happening when when Amanda was in in middle school. I mean, it's like 
Um, please don't use, you know, the the uh, season or your kid's name as a password, right? right. And, and how do we even measure that? Oftentimes, we're defaulting with security awareness to measuring it by doing some sort of fish campaign, um, which has got all sorts of other problems. Right. So, you know, I think we've got plenty of examples of how to do it wrong. How to do it right, I think we've got very, very few. Right. Right. So, um, you know, with regards to phishing tests, we've got some links in our show notes, uh, that I'll be posting up in here. Um, you know, I, I was reading through the, the, uh, simulated research from security week and they're saying, I actually tried to find something that said phishing tests are good versus phishing tests are bad to try to, you know, balance things out here. Um, but it said, like, like you said, uh, simulated phishing tests make organizations less secure. Uh, a 15 month phishing experiment done in partnership with an unnamed publicly traded global company. Researchers at ETH Zurich found embedded training during simulated phishing exercises did not make employees more resilient uh, to email lures and can have expected unexpected side effects that can make employees even more susceptible to phishing. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it, it's rough. Overall, the study participants clicked on 6,680 out of 117,000 simulated fishes. That's not bad. 5%. Um, like you said. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, they said they found many repeated clickers who felt victim to multiple lures and concluded that many employees and organizations will eventually fall for phishing if continually exposed. Um, you know, it, it just, whatever, you know, we've talked about this a lot, a lot too. It's like, you know, all you need is the right carrot to, to, to fish somebody. I, I, you know, I, I know that if somebody sends me a Kickstarter, that has something that looks like a, a D and D module that I may have kickstarted on, 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 I will click that fucking link every time because I am a Kickstarter freak and I, I, I support all that stuff. So if somebody sent me something even closely related to that, I would click on it. Um, you know, please, please don't, please don't send me any emails with Kickstarter shit in it. Um, but, uh, someone, but, go ahead. Someone got me last summer. Really? It was actually surprisingly well done. Someone was trying to get into my Instagram account. Okay. Um, and they recognized that MFA. So I saw the login prompt and I, you know, I was like, oh, you, ha, nice try. Nice try, you dork. I defeated you with MFA and I, you know, beat my chest and went on my day. Uh, it, it, an hour later, I'm in a meeting and mind you, in my head, I'm like, someone is trying to get into my Insta account because I keep seeing them hit the MFA. Yeah. I get an email from Instagram, you know, the one whenever you switch computers, right? Was this right. you? I said, was this you? Um, we just saw you log in from Yugoslavia on a Windows 7 computer with Internet Explorer. Oh, and, no. and needless no. to say, none of those three things match my use pattern. And said, if this wasn't you, click this link. How quickly do you think I clicked that link? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Mash that link. But here's the thing. So in, in our environment, we're, we're using uh, DNS security in the CASB. So the minute I clicked that link, my, my, uh, my DNS security popped up a message. My CASB popped up a message. And they're like, Wolf, you sweet summer child. That's a malware site. <laughs> what are you heart. doing? Bless your heart. Close that. Don't ever do that again. Right? And this is, this is one of the things. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to come back to where I, I've seen this done or heard this is done, right? But this is a good example of, we, we always expect people to do better. But if you look at multiple different industries, like when people first started flying planes, people went, wow, they're crashing planes. People must be stupid. Maybe the planes are going too fast. Maybe the human mind just can't keep up. And it took someone actually sitting down with the pilots going, oh, wait a minute. They can't reach the pedals and all the levers look the same. This is, this is terrible design, right? We had the same thing in car manufacturing. We had the same thing in automotive safety for years and years. Uh, why are people having so many car accidents? They asked circa 1920 to 1960. Um, we, we always blame the people. And really, any good industry sits down, does good root cause analysis, and puts in place good controls. Right. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have worked at companies that have done the fishing exercises because for whatever reason, I don't know if it, I, I don't know if this was the same kind of mentality where management didn't believe that fishing was an issue. So we had to go out and prove it. The same thing is like, well, we need a pen test to actually show 
that we're vulnerable because I've told them that we're vulnerable, but they don't believe me. So, you know, we're using these things as an agent of change. Um, I have, I, in my older age here, I've gotten a little more pragmatic about building relationships within my organization. And, you know, we're all, we're all supposed to be friendly and happy and security is supposed to be the friendly approachable company. And then it's like, let's send out something that is deceptive and, and they make them hate us. And then they have to spend time not doing their work and doing email training instead. Um, what are, so should, should we continue to do these things? Cause I did see some articles on like, you know, Oh, here's how to do these things correctly. And I was like, I don't think we should be doing them at all. Right. Um, or, or maybe we should be looking at different metrics than what we're expecting. Like we shouldn't be looking at things like click rate. We should be looking at who didn't click on it, who reported it, how many people reported it. I mean, what are some of the other, you know, other metrics that we should be looking at in a positive light instead of, hey, you clicked on it, you get to take another two hours of, you know, email security training? You know, I tell you, I, in my opinion, the information security industry will have arrived when the phishing simulation dies. I think the idea that, oh, let's teach my kid not to get his uh, lunch money robbed by waiting till he walks in the door, punching him in the gut and stealing his lunch money um, is exactly what we're doing with a lot of these lures. Right. Now, right. on the metric side, I'm going to throw it over to you and Amanda in just a minute, because one of the very first questions we had about security was your phishing program, because I thought you were doing something very intriguing. Uh, but Brian, one, one example, and this was given to me uh, by Chris Merkel. Um, so I was having a conversation about fishing companies need to die. We need to kill this industry. And, uh, and I was getting very frustrated. And what he does, which I think is really interesting, is instead his fish simulations, instead of popping up training or shaming you or making you feel terrible, what his fish simulations do is very similar to what happened to me. If you get caught with one of his simulated fish, it pops up the exact same security message that you would get if it was a real fish. And he tracks on the back end, people report it. And then he does not track that down to the individual. He tracks it at the department level. And I like that for a variety of different reasons. The person doesn't feel that they're targeted. They don't feel the security company is out to get them. Their job's not on the line. And security isn't maintaining a hit list that's used by HR to dismiss somebody. All these things we've seen in a variety of different companies. Okay. All right. So, so Miss Berlin, tell us a little bit about your fishing, uh, your fishing uh, work there. It's been a while. <laughs> back when she well, was in middle school. Back when I was in middle school, uh, we were fishing people re in regards to music videos. Um, like, you what? know, what was <laughs> your your top three TRL uh, votes? Okay. I, I was poor and I did I, not I have MTV. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so no. Um, yeah, so I, I ran a fishing uh, thing at the hospital that I worked at and we didn't do it per individual either. It was, it was <laughs> um, very immature because it was actually the first purple, red, whatever team type thing we ever did internally. We never had any user education when it came mm. to anything but I think maybe it was like how to change your password like was was like the only like uh computer-based training type stuff we had in, right. in, in tech stuff um and really we just started out with the high profile targets uh so not necessarily department based but more risk based so if anybody had their email address that you could find publicly those were our top targets um it was all very i, I think it was fairly well done uh, as uh considering how immature of a program it was just because we never faulted anybody which was fairly common in the beginning right. Right. um we never like we didn't fault them. We didn't shame them. It was all, Hey, <laughs> just, this is how you report things basically. Right. And us adding that kind of line of defense, um, uh, helped 
lessen the amount of time it took to detect things um okay. which was always a good metric but okay yeah I, mean, I agree like tracking it down per user i think is way too granular it, it that's like getting an alert every time a computer account gets locked out i i, I think if you track it down to every time someone falls for a phishing attempt or does something that may enhance like that's that's gonna wear you out <laughs> real quick right <clears throat> i actually um got told a story by somebody their their organization did the phishing exercise um they didn't they penalized the people who clicked on it but they also penalized the people who didn't report it because it was like you sh you 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 viewed what? the it they they were blame they they said well uh, you know the preview pane opened up the email so obviously they looked at the fish and you know if they didn't report it then that was a problem and, and I had to ask I had to ask them it's like do you hate your users do you, you know, what is your relationship with with the enterprise and and your and your people and they said oh we we're 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 great and I was like have you really asked people what their opinion of you is because you you saying that they're great and then you go and do shit like this does not bode well for your, your relationship with, with, with the organization. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, <clears throat> yeah, it, it bothers me there. And so Ms. Berlin, your IR stuff and, and Wolf, we're, I'll come back to you in a second here about, so instead of doing phishing campaigns, could we not just say, okay, Bill has been, you know, Bill clicked on a link. What does that mean to us? incident response tabletop, you know, the scenario is Bill has clicked on a link. What does Bill have access to? What's the damage for Bill if he got hit with this and it just happened to be ransomware and it's, you know, let's say he got hit by Emotet. Is that a better way of, of, of doing this where we can get rid of the phishing exercises altogether? Or, I mean, what, what is the, the impetus for management to feel like they need these phishing tests? Is this, is it RSA that caused the phishing tests, the rise of our, you know, phishing tests or, um, uh, what, you know, what, what caused that? If you just replace all phishing tests with zero trust. Oh, wow. Then Bingo. We'll be fine. <laughs> Done. Go I fixed go, it. Go, go ahead, Wolf. <laughs> go ahead, Wolf. Go ahead. Oh, No. <laughs> First and last time he'll be on our and show. Go. Yep. This is like this is this is our debate now. Like uh... that, that hurts. That hurts. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, so what's interesting about this though, think about this for just a minute. This is another flaw in in the security uh, industry. The security industry has has several like fatal flaws. One of them is we always blame the people. Another fatal flaw is we think whenever we put a control in place, that's it. Like I will deploy this control and the adversaries will be like, I had no idea he would have tool X. You know what? I'm reconsidering all my life choices. I'm not gonna write any more spam. I'm gonna go straight and they log off the internet and they're no longer a cyber criminal, right? And, and arguably flaw three is our, habit of putting cyber in front of everything but back to flaw two um whenever we put in place a control and the control reaches a certain level of efficacy people automatically work right around it right immediately around it so yep. if we could wave a, a a magic wand chase cunningham's magic wand and all of a sudden 100% of the enterprises in the Fortune 1000 have zero trust. And everyone at the Security Poverty Line are given more people and more money and they're working this problem. Well, what happened is almost immediately, adversaries would work around zero trust. We're seeing this right now with, with multi-factor, right? When not many people are running multi-factor, multi-factor was hugely effective. <clears throat> now that more people are, it's starting to be worked around. We will also start to see this with passwordless because passwordless is fish resistant. And what that means by being fish resistant is it will not provide um, the credential. It will not provide the credential 
to a bad link, right? It will do some link checking and everything for you. No matter how much you want to click on that link and get a credential, it won't. What will happen is, and we're already starting to see signs of this. I've been predicting this for two years. What will happen is we're going to see a rise of OAuth and OIDC phishing, where it'll be a completely valid link. And it'll say, hey, please click on this. And you'll click on it. And now the adversary will, through a trust chain, through federated identity, have access into, into an environment. Every time we put in place to control, an adversary works around it. Now, what that means is, will zero trust solve it? No, of course not. But would, would strong authentication mitigate it? Yes, of course. Are there certain things we can do? Absolutely. I think bottom line is we need to spend more time looking at how the adversaries work in, spend more time thinking about what will happen after we put in place the control, and spend less time trying to get normal people, our friends and colleagues in the company, to do our jobs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, yeah, it, it <clears throat> we, um, we waste a lot of time, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't, I, I honestly think that the, the, the fishing, uh, frameworks, we, we don't get a lot of benefit out of it um, other than it makes us look good because we use these vanity metrics to show that we're actually kind of doing something. Um, look at all uh, we did. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, we managed to deceive, you know, a third of our company by threatening them with their insurance uh, benefits or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, the I the, the if last thing you doing if if you doing all of that work does not do anything to in like decrease time to detection, like it's worthless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no that yeah, that makes that makes 100% uh, uh truth. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I mean The, the problem is we have security people suggesting this to management, which means the security people aren't getting it. Um, and management thinks it's a great idea because, oh, metrics, um, you know, um, and oh, if the security people think we need it, then we need to have it. And uh, we need to probably to, to move that around. Um, the, you know, the, the phishing training and the reason we had uh, uh, Wolf on uh, also uh, because of his, his post on, on Twitter, I had seen a, a Alyssa Miller mention how you can set specific rules in your email inbox to filter like no before kind of phishing tests or, or certain companies that, uh, you know, advertise their phishing tests where you just put something in your uh, outlook and it'll automatically delete that. And then you never get it in the first place. But, um, yeah. Um, what's this? Uh, YTT says I send none. I teach the things that make me suspicious and I'll mitigate it as soon as possible. Oh yeah. Excellent. YTT. Uh, Digital Word says, I agree. My company only sends phishing attempts and no educational follow up or sec cybersecurity articles in their daily mailer. Uh, it's just like they keep casting into a pond of goldfish and keep picking them off with no learning. Oh, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> um, so I've been collecting a series of tips on people who either are not phishing or are um, phishing uniquely. I mentioned Chris Merkel and his example mm -hmm. of. Every fish is anonymous and it looks just like a regular fish, right? right? So if anyone is like, hey, I am not fishing, I'm collecting other evidence this way or I'm doing awareness training that way, uh, I would love to hear about it. Um, I am meeting with researchers on this topic and into it because we're coming up on 30 years, believe it or not, we're coming up on 30 years of fish. And, right. uh, and I would like to see that the simulation end. <laughs> and I would like to see us get better. So yeah. for people who do have some great ideas, please let us know. Yep. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, the, um, yeah, we could definitely replace fishing exercise, uh, you know, fishing, fishing engagements like this with, uh, you know, um, so, okay. So we're not allowed as the blue team or the security people internally to do fishing exercises. Can, should we continue to allow security assessors to use those as an in because, you know, you, you hear stories about pen testing firms are like, oh, well, I, you know, I spent two weeks trying to get in, you know, via this way, but I just decided in the end to send a fish and, oh yeah, somebody clicked on it and I'm in. Should we still allow those as a, you know, part of the scope for engagements or should we just make those off limits like DDoS testing? Why are we testing what we know? <clears throat> yes. If you send my people a fish, you will get in. Uh, also, I think that can still backfire. So um, Ian Meyer is another person I've talked to, and he's got a great series of talks on ethical fisheries. 
And when I was talking with Ian, I told him the story. I'll tell you guys that we were trying to get in. I was doing the um, I was doing the advisory and program development. My red team was testing our work. So I'm meeting with the CISO. I'm meeting with um, his director and I'm asking some questions. And all of a sudden, both of their phones start blowing up. And the CISO steps out. He says, I'll be right back. And then I'm just talking with the director. And the director is like, oh my God, I gotta go too. And then I'm all alone. Like, what is going on? So later on in the day, I found out what had happened. We had sent a fish from HR. The CEO had remembered vaguely HR talking about doing some surveys and put together the CEO's email. And he included that fish in his email and said, we really care about everyone. Everyone should you know, reply to this right away and sent it out company-wide. So our, our pretext got sent out and I think our click rate was like 90%, right? Because like everyone, if the CEO says do it, do it. Right. Now right, right, you may right. say, let's take the red team perspective. Oh, that was a great test. We really, we showed them, we got in. Let's take the security team's perspective. Do you think that that CEO was on board after being tricked to bring in another security consultant? No. Or to do anything like that again? No. Yeah. No. no. The, the damage that that did to the relationships at the executive level, incalculable. But our red team was certainly happy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we yeah, know you, these things will work. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. I was trying to, trying to find some stuff out here. Uh, okay. I don't think, I think that's pretty much all we've, we've got here. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, what are some, okay. So fishing, fishing is out. You don't, you don't like fishing. You want to get rid of fishing altogether. Uh, fishing tests in this case, uh, Wolf, what, what other things from a training point of view, would you like to get rid of? <laughs> we have nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we could go a little longer if you'd like, if you want to be loquacious about it. Uh, we're, we're not, we're not beholden to the two hour mark. You're not going to have more children come through this door. I, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Out. All right. Yes. Let's pick the top that is, one. That is a long what, list. I, yeah. What's the top? I think one? just in the, the top. Well, I think just in general, anytime we're trying to tell people to just stop and think we're really doing the wrong thing. If you, if you look at like system one, system two thinking, right. Thinking fast and slow. Yep. Um, what do people prefer? They spend most of their time thinking fast. As a matter of fact, I think the ratio is uh, nine to one, right? Out of 10 activities, you want nine of them just to be automatic. Yeah, we're going to be the security team that said, no, I'll be 10 times. You need to stop and think through everything you're doing. What kind of advice is that? I really think we need to look at wherever people are having trouble completing those controls. And instead of going, wow, we just need to give them more awareness training. And let them know maybe if we just had better data and better colors and and maybe not a black and white video, but something with music, something catchy from the 90s. That will that'll maybe <laughs> we just need to pause and go, wow, what is it in our design, in our understanding of the organization, our implementation of security technology that's just lacking? What, what are we missing? Right. And and take that approach. Yep. So would do, does in-house created training, is it better or is it, is there still a market for, you know, Joe, Bob, Billy's, you know, security training companies videos? So I was, I was talking with the CISO and he, he said something that really um, struck home to me. He's like, Are, do you, do you try and do organizational change? Like, yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you try and do like lead change efforts and change culture? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I mean, I love culture change. I love culture framework. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. So do you have a degree in organizational psych? I'm like, mm. no, I, don't, I do not. He's like, well, I do. And I don't do it. Do you know why? I'm like, no clue. He goes, because my degree was 20 years ago. And I'm a technologist. Why in technology are we so convinced that we can educate people? Brian, you, you mentioned your, your wife is going through a doctorate on this. Why are we so convinced that we can educate people better? right? That we can lead culture better. We do all these things um, in part because we got into technology and no one else knew it. And right. we did. So we oftentimes think, well, I, I don't know that other thing. So how hard can it be? There was a tweet walking around that really like captured, I think, a lot of our attitude. 
And it was this little girl and she's like, I want to be an astronaut. And uh, her mom's like, well, you, you'd have to, you know, go to college and get a doctorate and you'd have to go physical training and you'd have to apply to NASA and you'd have to get uh, accepted in the program and you'd have to do their thing. And a little girl thought for a minute, she goes, okay, that's five things. I think I can do five things. And that's that's nice. our answer. Those just five things, right? Nice. I, I honestly think, you know, and I would love to talk to your wife. Honestly, this is where I'm at at the moment, Brian. But uh, I, I honestly think we need to reach out to people who have these expertise and, and leverage them and stop right. thinking we have the solution for it all. That's cool. Yeah, she actually went to a training co- or an educational conference on, on you know, this on uh, talking about adult learners and stuff. And I was like, wow, that would be a conference that I'd like to go to to talk about education stuff because... Um, yeah, there, there, there's definitely some, some room for, for, for us folks trying to either create content kind of like this. I, you know, I, I don't imagine that people are actually using our shit for internal stuff. Sorry if, for internal people there. Um, but, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, it, it would be interesting to, to, to talk to those folks. And I've actually been trying to get my wife on the show here, but she, she has super imposter syndrome. So, um, she's, she's still working on her dissertation parts and, and, and you're trying to get that stuff done, but I will have her on at some point in the future, uh, talking about it, uh, training and stuff. And I'll, um, send along your, uh, your, your, your information, uh, and see what you, you two can, uh, talk about on that. So, um, yeah, okay. That. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right. So, uh, I, I know that it's getting late for the folks on the East coast, uh, Ms. Berlin. And like you said, she's yelling at kids behind her, uh, very mom, like trying, trying not to let people know, get your ass in bed, get your ass in bed now or, or something like that. But I want a hug. I don't want to brush my teeth. first. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, mom. It's okay, mom. You're, you're doing great. You're doing great. Um, but so uh, I'll, I, I think we should end the show here. We can definitely have uh, Wolf back on at some point in the future. I hope uh, if uh, he, he's amenable to that. Uh, no, Wolf, how? Oh, you really? know? Oh, yeah. Took this long. Not. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, it, is, Ber- it is. It is Berlining down security here. <laughs> it so. is. Berlining, not breaking down. It's Berlining down security. Yeah. No, we're just going to switch you out. Wolf, you're up. Brian. Oh. (laughs) Yes. Then I then I can call him me. That's right. (laughs) Yes. That's right. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, I'm going to let everybody go. Uh, uh, Wolf, let, uh, how would people find you if they wanted to talk more about fishing exercises or non-fishing exercises or, or what have you, uh, or just security in general, how would they find you? Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm at sure. JW Gorlick on Twitter. Uh, my website is jwgorlick.com. I can throw that in chat if you want. Okay. And I'm at coming to a security conference near you, probably. Very nice. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, Ms. Berlin, how would people find you if you're online? Um, at InfoSister on Twitter, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Um, the next place I will be, <clears throat> I believe, is DEF CON. Oh, nice. Okay. Y'all doing workshops or anything there? Is DEF CON first or is Blue Team CON first? Uh, DEF CON Blue is. Blue Team is first. No, is Blue it? Team CON is the same weekend as InfoSec Camp Out. And it's after August 26th. Oh. Yeah. And it's after. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Then I will be at DEF CON next, which okay. we will have for mental health hackers. We're having, we're, we're not catering. We are making our own because catering's really freaking expensive in Vegas. Uh, okay. We're doing brunch. So watch our Twitter account. Um, on Saturday, we have a, a uh, suite at Caesars, and we're going to be doing brunch and a full talk track and a whole bunch of mental health-related things in a room. Nice. So, yeah, it turns out um, when you ask Caesars, one, they won't let you bring any external catering companies in. You have to use Caesars. Of course. Um, Guess how much it is for a continental brunch, which is fruit, coffee, and tea per person. Oh. 
50 ahead. Ooh, close. 45. 45. Yes. $45 for fruit, coffee, and tea. I was I was five dollars over. Oh, because we're not a gaming company. We're just gonna do it ourselves and we're gonna go to Costco. <laughs> there you go. Muffins. And buy a bunch of hot plates and make pancakes <clears throat> and make French toast and make a whole bunch of stuff and just wing it. So I that's know. like we're making nice. our like uh, Megan's family has a uh, a condo out there, so she's gonna bake a whole bunch of like fresh fresh baked stuff. Um, yeah, and we're gonna we could probably fly people out <laughs> to cook for cheaper than it would be yeah. for oranges and coffee. I can come out and make pop tarts. I, I you know I can do that. I can do that oh. for you. <laughs> pop tarts <laughs> is a great idea. <laughs> uh yeah shit um so um uh uh, uh, wolf more than one person has asked in our chat about you joining our discord or slack so i put in the in the zoom chat uh the invite to our discord and or our slack if you want to do it no pressure oh thank you um so feel free to join us on there we have a code of conduct on both of them so you know abide by it or i'll kick your ass out myself um uh and uh um mr betcher is on vacation he's in orlando seeing the sites uh hopefully he'll be back very shortly uh he is at betcher pwned on twitter uh b-o-e-t-t-c-h-e-r-p-w-n-e-d he also is the developer lead developer for log dash md windows forensic tool to get your windows logs right in your windows machines uh also does i believe timelining it's a freemium model so there's a free version and then a paid version if you want to go check that out uh log dash md.com uh, you can follow the podcast and the broadcast at BreakSec on Twitter, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. And if you are uh, wanting to join our Discord, check that out, break, discord.gg forward slash BreakSec. Um, I'm also on Mastodon. Miss Berlin's also on Mastodon as well. Same handles, Brian Brake and InfoSister. Yeah, I've, I follow you on tw- on Mastodon, Miss Berlin. I've not been on Mastodon in forever okay okay i used it when it first became a thing and like this is lame and left (laughs) yeah i i have tried it and it's i'm also on google wave Uh, what what so am i or was um i'm on i'm on google plus uh you can find me on google plus at no i'm just kidding um anyway (laughs) but yeah um you know we're all over the place i'd like to thank linux parrot for all of the 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 bugs that he sent us uh thank you for for helping us out with that uh for all of you new listeners uh, here you can uh, get 175 hours of twitch streaming uh by subscribing if you have an amazon prime account you can uh, give us a free subscription which will give you access to all of those things including two to three times a week i get on and i just do some hack the box stuff to to play around with sql map and and to get my sysp credits so um uh, oh, yes. YTT says she's on AOL chat. My AOL chat was T-S-R-A-G-R-W-X, which I was in the Navy as a weather person. So T-S-R-A-G-R was like thunderstorms with hailstones or whatever. But that was my handle on AOL. Um, cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, oh, one last thing before we go. I want to show I want to show this. This is something that is like just happened today. So you're going to get to see our show notes. I'm going to drop this over the top here. Our logos for InfoSec Campout, uh, done by uh, Shell Domko, who uh, did our um, did did the art for Ms. Berlin last year. Uh, took her logos and turned them into InfoSec Campout 2021. Um, we asked her to do some logos for us this year, and these are the logos that we're going to have for our uh, conference. Uh, I wanted, I, to be honest, I had th- suggested a bit more of a macabre scene with the bears where there was maybe some dead humans uh, uh, around, um, but I, I decided maybe to tone it down a little bit. Uh, so this is the, the the design for the shirt. And she said, hey, I created a special bear specifically for things like stickers. And I was like, wow, that's freaking amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that. So uh, these are going to be what we're going to be putting in our store uh, and you'll be able, if you're a ticket holder or bought a ticket already, you will be able to, uh, get a discount, uh, a code for, for a t-shirt and, and any other paraphernalia up to a certain amount from the store. 
What's that, Miss Berlin? Sorry, I thought I was on mute. Oh, no worries. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, we're a live show y'all. Um, so yeah, if, uh, you're, um, not able to come to the conference and you still want to get one of these t-shirts, uh, or stickers or what have you, uh, we'll be releasing the link to that store. Um, I would also like to say, if you go to infosetcampout.com, uh, you can also buy tickets if you want to join us, uh, infosetcampout.com. And, uh, yeah, we are, you know, we're, we're still looking for speakers, uh, and it is, of course, yes, the same weekend as Blue Team Con, but, uh, oh, crap. Okay. Oh, I spelled InfoSec Camp out wrong. Uh, extra O there. So, um, <clears throat> but if you are interested in joining us, uh, we have a social contract, a code of conduct. Uh, we are camping, a backyard camping conference. So come and join us if you'd like. Uh, we do, uh, we will be updating the t-shirt link to the uh, merchant store uh, and our CFP uh, link is always available here. So um, we are going to be making sure that we're transparent about our speakers. Uh, we are also uh, taking steps uh, to make sure that all of our speakers are above board and there will be uh, no special guests. Um, just just to let everybody know. Cool. All right. Well, that was it for th uh, this week on uh, Breaking Down Security. Uh, thank you again, Wolf, for coming. I uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time and uh, to do so. Uh, Miss Berlin, pleasure as always. I'm glad you could be here with us uh, and you're safe. And um, yeah, uh, take care, uh, you know, take care of yourselves uh, uh, because you're the only you you have. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Bye, y'all. See everybody. Thanks so much.